Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for that uh, nice introduction. At this outset, I'd like to thank uh, organizers, uh, Global Fertility Academy and Topic for this uh, opportunity. And I would especially would like to thank uh, Mr. Sherman and Ms. Anne for their continuous support. So uh, last uh, three, four sessions where your brain was stuffed with a lot of material, which is uh, really difficult to digest. And uh, now we are moving, though it is a post uh, lunch session, we are mov moving towards a much simpler topic on male infertility. We are just looking at the clinical aspects of male infertility, and we will see how uh, the, these topics are clinically relevant and the presented topics, how we, what we can incorporate into our clinical uh, practice. So the overview, uh, if you take, uh, we have uh, taken four papers presented in the male infertility session in the last uh, essay. Uh, basically, they address two major issues. Uh, the first one being the hot topic of in male infertility which is known as uh, reactive oxygen species and uh, DNA damage in, of sperm, uh, the impacts of uh, its uh, in male infertility practice and uh, uh, its uh, outcome. And the second one, the first two studies will be basically looking at uh, DNA fragmentation. The second and fourth study, which is really interesting, one is on the outcome of both, both discusses about the microdissection TSA and outcome of uh, offsprings in Klinfurter syndrome. And the second one, uh, relatively very new innovative te technique in male infertility, the round spermatid injection. How we are going to do the round spermatid injection and what are the out outcome, what we are going to get. The first study is uh, assessment of impact of oxidative stress on frozen seminal plasma in infertile and fertile men, and assessing the total antioxidant capacity. You might have heard about DNA fragmentation quite a lot, but this is a different technique uh, of assessing uh, anti I mean, DNA damage, looking at the total antioxidant capacity of the seminal plasma. Everyone knows that uh, uh, basically uh, male infertility is caused by the sperm dysfunction. Whatever may be the reason, if you look at, there are a lot of etiological factors which causes uh, uh, sperm dysfunction, but uh, the saddest thing is that uh, many of them, they are not very treatable, treatable conditions. Either they are congenitally inherited genetic disorders, and uh, many times it is not medically treatable, and you cannot manipulate th that particular situation. But the good thing about uh, oxidative uh, stress and DNA damage is uh, it's medically uh, treatable condition, and uh, definitely elevated levels of reactive oxygen species uh, during uh, causes oxidative stress. And uh, when their total antioxidant capacity is low and the, this oxidative stress goes up, there can be an insult to the uh, sem, uh, sperm uh, in, during the transit time. So why the uh, seminal plasma needs a t uh, total antioxidant system? Basically, two types of antioxidant systems are available in the seminal plasma, one being the enzymatic and non-enzymatic. Because during spermatogenesis, what happens is the sperm cell, if you see, it, it has to undergo a modification. It has to shed out all its cytoplasm. So basically, the DNA damage, if, if at all happens to a cell, it has to be repaired by the cytoplasmic elements. So once they shed out, shed out the cytoplasm, it is difficult to repair the DNA damage, which is causing at the time of uh, spermatogenesis or later at the transit time. So there is an efficient total I mean, antioxidant system in the seminal plasma. And definitely, low seminal total antioxidant capacity, which is known as the tax score, has been uh, low in infertile men. Why we have taken this study? Uh, because it's, it's a, if you look at the quality of the study, which is, it's not very great. It's just an observational study of 50 fertile and non-fertile men with proven men, uh, previously supposed to be normosuspermic. But very hardly, uh, the total antioxidant capacity, targeting total antioxidant capacity, the studies are very few in the literature. And the second one, uh, depending upon the total antioxidant capacity, the DNA damage 
can be to certain extent prevented. So what they did after thawing, they compared uh, the total antioxidant capacity or the tax score, which is expressed in Trollock's uh, concentration, and uh, the same thing, uh, the same samples were correlated with the uh, morphology, mor motility, and concentration based on the WHO analysis. And they have performed acridine orange test uh, to know the uh, capacity, uh, uh, the extent of uh, DNA damage. So let us see what happens, in, what they found out. So after uh, throwing the semen sample, uh, they found that uh, the, the, there was not much difference in the motility and the sperm con concentration. And if you take uh, the morphological aspect, the, when in infertile patients, uh, the morphology was much lower and the DUFI was uh, high, which was uh, 17 percentage in uh, uh, infertile men, where it was 10 percentage in the fertile men. A tax score, which is expressed, I told you, in Trolux uh, concentration, was 830 for uh, infertile men, which was uh, 1000 to above 1200 for the fertile men. This is the uh, graph showing uh, mean DFI in infertile and fertile men. Then uh, the mean, this is what I told you already, the mean The mean uh, tax score was 1,200 for uh, infertile, fertile men, and which was very pretty low and statistically significant uh, levels, uh, which is low in uh, infertile men. Sperm morphology was the biggest uh, correlate, the best correlating factor in the uh, sperm parameters. So, uh, the conclusions are: infertile patient group showed significantly lower tax score and high levels of DNA uh, concentration, as well as poor morphology in infertile men compared to the fertile men. So how I'm going to Im I mean, implement this in my clinical practice? Total antioxidant capacity of seminal plasma is a reliable, simple, and cheap and reproducible compared to the sperm DNA fragmentation test, which is reliable. You have two types of methods for uh, assessing tax score which is known as calorimetric method and chemiluminescent method. If you choose a calorimetric method, which is much cheaper, simple, and reliable for a treatable condition. The, this, uh, if the uh, tax score is high, you, you can treat it with uh, antioxidants from outside. So this is how it, it is going to be uh, useful in our clinical practice. The second one, it's again, uh, uh, the meta-analysis which is uh, presented in the last essay on uh, the test for DNA fragmentation and their predictive capacity for the uh, IRT outcome in terms of live birth rate. So everyone knows that uh, sperm DNA damage is associated with uh, poor a ART outcome in terms of uh, low fertilization, uh, low I mean bad quality embryo development, low implantation, recurrent implantation, recurrent implantation, uh, implantation failure, so on and so forth. And basically, we have uh, uh, two kinds of uh, sperm DNA fragmentation tests. One is known as direct test, and the second one is known as indirect test. Direct test being the tunnel assay and the comet assay. What the direct uh, test uh, will uh, uh, show is directly they will go and the probes are made and they directly go and get attached to the site of damage. Uh, indirect test means they just assess the denaturing and once the, they introduce to the acid solution what is the denaturation capacity of the DNA. So the SESA and SED are the indirect test. It was a systematic review. Uh, the quality of that systematic review, we, should, we need to get the full uh, data to assess. But whatever we could, could gather from uh, the oral presentation, the quality-wise, it, uh, uh, the, uh, the, it, it's reasonable. The quality of the study was quite reasonable. Uh, if you assess whatever, uh, whatever the data we could gather from the oral presentation. Then uh, the only one uh, drawback was the total number of studies and included was uh, less. And from there, uh, this quality assessment was performed and uh, receiver operator curves were made 
uh, to assess the association of, I mean, the predictive capacity of each test in terms of uh, live birth. And it was separately assessed for IUI, IVF, and ICSI procedures. <coughs> Sorry. The predictive ac accuracy when with the receiver operator curve, basically, uh, I think uh, uh, we had just now a discussion when it was, uh, when it was telling about uh, the sensitivity and specificity. ROC curves are basically, you plot sensitivity on one axis, to make a direct relationship, you make a one minus specificity on the other graph, other uh, axis, and whenever the values moves towards that side, it is significant. Finally, what you get is area under the curve. If you get a value of area under the curve, if it is more than 0 0.8 or 0 0.9, which is supposed to be a good association. When the area under the curve value is uh, less than 0 0.6, it is poorly associated. So from this study, they could find out uh, the area, area under the curve uh, for uh, tunnel assay was 0 0.7, which was reasonable. The, but not, none of the other tests will uh, show the association of uh, good association with pregnancy uh, prediction. Then uh, this is only uh, the tunnel assay was used to investigate differences in sensitivity and specificity in IVF and ICSI cycles separately. No difference in predictive value of tunnel in, in pregnancy outcome was observed between the, these treatments. Why it is important? Because previously we used to think uh, when the DNA fragmentation is high, if we could, we could go for ICSI, we can bypass uh, the certain uh, extent of uh, DNA damage. Because in IVF, the co-incubation time is much more. The number of sperms exposed to the eggs are more. Finally, the chance of getting ROS damage to the oocyte is more. But if you do ICSI and bypass this effect, they found that uh, the previous thinking was that if you go through the literature, it, it was uh, said that ICSI is the first line option when the DNA fragmentation is much high. But they disproved it. And the predictive accuracy of SCA, SCD, and the comet assays were poor. So uh, what are the conclusions of this uh, study? The predictive value of the most uh, sperm DNA damage test uh, to pregnancy rate was poor. Only tunnel assay may have some predictive value, but uh, the uh, spe pooled specificity of the tunnel assay was slow. So <clears throat> even men with high DNA fragmentation also were able to achieve pregnancy. The predictive value of uh, tunnel for separately for IVF and ICSI are the same. So you cannot uh, help in deciding which treatment option they should go for. So how I'm going to implement it in my clinical practice is that being a more laborious, very cost-involved uh, 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 test uh, in increasing healthcare cost and to prevent over-testing, these uh, DNA damage tests we should not offer routinely for each and every patient coming to, into your cl clinic. Maybe for an example, if the patient has got a recurrent uh, uh, poor performance in the previous IVF cycle, we can offer unexplained infertility we can offer, uh, I mean, uh, uh, poor uh, fertilization, poor embryo development in the previous cycles we can offer, and uh, RIF patients also we can offer. That's about the DNA fragmentation. We'll move to the third study. Uh, risk level of intracytoplasmic, uh, sp either sperm or spermatid injection in KFS uh, patients. We assess the, assessing the offsprings, uh, the chromosomal uh, assessment of the offsprings were done. Everyone knows uh, uh, KFS is most common chromosomal abnormality, which you see in uh, your practice in among asuspermic men. And these men with uh, KFS uh, possesses one X extra X chromosome. The incidence of sex chromosome abnormal abnormalities is reportedly high. If you see the previous literature, uh, it is reportedly high. Uh, when they went in for microdissection, TSA and ICSI. So this was a retrospective study of 215 men who had previously diagnosed to have non-mosaic clean fertile syndrome. 
And what they did was uh, the clinical outcome of ICSI was measured. The offsprings uh, karyotyping were done after the pregnancy happened. And the most important part of this study was uh, they did the fish analysis of spermatogonia, primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, and uh, spermatids. So this is very important slide in this particular study. You can see whenever it is at the stage of spermatogonia, there, there was a, a percentage of uh, spermatogonia had abnormal uh, X and y, X chromosome in them. But when they shifted from once them, I, I'll just uh, explain to you about the meiosis. Uh, first the spermatogonia, then it goes undergoes mitosis, then primary spermatocyte, then meiosis, secondary spermatocytes, and round spermatid, and uh, uh, mature spermatozoa. So when the selection of uh, cell division started from the spermatogonia to primary spermatocyte, when they did fish probing, the chromosome, there were no abnormal chromosome in that 500 uh, 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 spermatids or uh, early stage spermatid which they did. The same thing with the spermatid, spermatids also. Primary spermatocyte and spermatids were absolutely normal. And uh, this is the uh, pregnancy rate uh, with uh, testicular sperm. It was around 22 percentage. Early stage spermatid, it's around 14 percentage. Late stage spermatid was 16, per 16 percentage. And uh, the f most uh, uh, fantastic part of uh, this study was uh, they could get three live pregnancies, uh, number of live birth rate, and 25 live, live birth rate from late spermatid and early spermatid injection. And there were no congenital abnormalities were detected. So the implications are uh, the karyotyping, karyotyping of the newborn using the gametes from the Klinfetter syndrome men was 100% normal. And the fish analysis of 50 spermatids and the early stage spermatocytes were also normal. This suggests that the risk of intracytoplasmic sperm and spermatid injection into oocyte in this population is much lower than previously expected, which is very helpful when you counsel a patient with Klinfetter syndrome when they have decided for microdissection T cell. And the mechanism of disomic uh, sperm production, it's still clearly unknown, but we, we believe that the one extra chromosome is derived from the uh, incompletely extruded second polar body of the oocyte. It's, uh, it's from the maternal side, not from the paternal side. The fourth one is uh, the last uh, study uh, about the round spermatid injection and its uh, clinical outcome. Round spermatid injection, if you see in the literature, which was, which is mentioned as a very ineffective procedure in non-obstructive vasospermia. But uh, was a big chunk of your patients with non-obstructive spermia, uh, non-obstructive vasospermia, end up with uh, uh, not obtaining mature spermatid or sperm. But still, the, you can find a spermat, I mean, uh, primary or secondary spermatocyte in them, or round spermatid in them. So we could offer. Uh, if uh, we incorporate uh, round spermatid injection into clinical practice, we can effectively manage certain subgroup of population where the sperm, mature sperm or elongated spermatids are not derived after microdissection T cell. Why round spermatid injection is an ineffective pr process? There are basically uh, two reasons. Uh, because the first thing is there is something called uh, oocyte activation after fertilization, which is derived from sperm-associated oocyte activating factor, which is released from the nuclear chromatin of the sperm. You know, uh, because once the spermatogenesis happens, the sperm chromatin is, uh, the chromatin is packed and contents. After fertilization, it loosens up. When it loosens up, that time, this uh, uh, the factor is released and which causes the activation of oocytes, which is not there when you inject the round spermatid. And the second reason, 
identification of round spermatids are very difficult. It looks like polymorphonuclear leukocyte. It looks like uh, 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 monocytes. It looks like lymphocytes and spermatogonia also. So these are the two major problem. The second, uh, uh, second problem was practically more difficult. And th uh, there are a few other postulated uh, uh, theoretical postulations also. Because of uh, asynchronous uh, cell cycle, it may be the post-fertilization development, implantation develop, post-fertilization uh, development and implantation, it may be affected. Then there is high chance for genomic imprinting also uh, uh, when you use round spermatid injection. So if we use uh, uh, a new technology which, with which effectively we can do round spermatid injection, it will be of great help for your patients. So 76 non-obstructive uh, non NOA patients who had first microdissection, then they could not uh, get uh, elongated spermatid or round, I mean, uh, uh, mature spermatozoa in them. Their round spermatids were frozen. Then these were used for uh, uh, round spermatid injection, this study, over a four years of time. I'm very happy to tell you that this is the paper, uh, this paper from by Tanaka, which is one of our uh, steering committee member, members of uh, Global Fertility Academy. Then uh, they were, uh, uh, after, uh, uh, after, uh, after uh, uh, getting the frozen, I mean, frozen toad round spermatid, they were cytologically selected. I told you about the cytological selection. If we have a phase contrast microscopy and an, uh, I mean, uh, mm, very uh, experienced person to search for the round spermatid, looking at the uh, acrosomal vacuoles and the nucleocytoplasmic ratio and the size of the spermatid, we will be able to find out. And electrically stimulated. The oocytes were before ICSI electrically stimulated, then it was injected. There are two types of oocyte uh, activation. Either you can electrically stimulate or you can add calcium ionophores. Then to confirm that that particular oocyte is electrically activated, they have measured the uh, post-activation calcium concentration inside the oocyte also. So these are the result. Uh, 58. Uh, 58 uh, patients, uh, they went in for uh, fresh transfers. Then they could get nine pregnancies, nine live birth rate from them. And uh, pregnancy rate was around 16 percentage. Then out of these uh, uh, 68 patients, 10 patients went in for frozen transfer. And 18 patients, again, after first cycle failed, they came back for the frozen embryo transfer. Then they had a pregnancy rate of, uh, then they had a live birth rate of five, per, five, five total number of uh, five live, live birth rates were obtained from the frozen, uh, frozen uh, FET cycles. Here, look at the pregnancy rate of 23.8 percentage, which was a little bit high. How I explain this? Because again, in a frozen cycle compared to a fresh cycle, endometrial receptivity is better. That is how I will explain that. So they did the karyotyping after that, of, of uh, the pre pregnancies, live birth, which we, they got. All of them were normal. And they uh, checked for the genomic imprinting diseases also. They were also normal. All babies are healthy and without any serious physical, cognitive, or uh, uh, physiolog physical deficits. So conclusions, in men with round spermatid, ROSI improved clinical outcomes in terms of fertilization, cleavage, and pregnancy rates. And the percentage of, percentage of live birth and uh, babies delivered with the proper oocyte activation and proper selection of round spermatid. When there is accurate identification of round spermatids and proper oocyte activation, ROSI proves clinically effective and has a high potential, uh, potential to help many non-obstructive asuspermic men whose most advanced spermatogenic cells are round spermatid. 
So to summarize, the first study, total antioxidant capacity scoring is of seminal plasma is a reliable and simple test for the diagnosis and management of male infertility. The predictive value of most DNA uh, fragmentation tests for pregnancy is poor. Only tunnel assay was uh, correlating with the pregnancy prediction. It was not an association, pregnancy prediction. And uh, the pooled specificity was again low for even for tunnel assay in terms of IVF or ICSI. The karyotyping of newborn babies using gametes from clean fertilized men were 100% normal. And the fish analysis of 500 spermatids from, from <coughs> KFS men were also haploid. The men with round spermatids, ROSI improved clinical outcome in terms of fertilization, cleavage, and pregnancy rates, and the percentage of offsprings delivered with effective oocyte uh, uh, activation and proper round spermatid uh, selection. Thank you very much for your patient hearing.